Chapter 11 Test Day It is test day, multiple choice. So each of us has been given a stupid Scantron form where we fill in the bubbles to indicate our answers. A through E. I am going to use the bubbles to make a picture. Last time it was mountains. With the rest of the time, I will work on agency business. That's when old man Cruckus says he has an announcement. For today's test, you are going to work in groups. Rolo took us. His eyes widen. Each group will turn in one test and get one grade. Rolo gasps. The group you are seated with will be your group. Rolo takes one look at me and passes out. I take no notice of Rolo for I am focused on having to join forces with the one whose name shall not be uttered. So I express my opinion respectfully. I refuse. Rollo moans from the floor. Old man Crocus shouts for me to get off the desk. Molly Moskin claps. It is something she does each time she gets to work with me. Molly's clapping sends waves of tangerine smell everywhere. Soon we all smell like tangerine people. Old man Crocus shuts his eyes in frustration. He grits his worn wooden teeth. He is one unhappy tangerine. Chapter 12. Why Fuzzy Wuzzy Wasn't. The one thing about the detective business is that it doesn't stop for you to solve the cases you've already got like that of Gunner's mysterious candy. You just have to keep going. You can't crawl into some corner and give up. Which is exactly what Max Hodges hamster appears to have done. I found him like this when I got up this morning. Max tells me as I stand in his bedroom, so I called you to see if you can figure out how he died. Together we stare at the motionless hamster in the hamster cage. How do you know he's not alive? I ask. Well, he says, handing me a photo. Because when he's alive, he looks like this. Which is different than how he looks now. So I ask Max the obvious. The stuff even an amateur detective knows to ask in a dead hamster case. Did he have any enemies? Max says no. Did he have a lot of money? No. Was he depressed? No. Was he involved in criminal activity? No. When it comes to crime, witnesses can clam up. So if you're a detective in these situations, you got to put some of your own pressure on the witness. Not involved in criminal activity, I say sarcastically. Then what is this? 
I point at a bit of hamster tube that appears to have a name scratched into it. I scratched my name on there, says Max. Looks like hamster graffiti to me, I say. It's not, he says. So I grab the piece of hamster tube and put it in my pocket. Evidence, I say. I show myself to the door, but when I go to open it, it won't budge. I duck low, expecting an ambush. That's when I see Total lying on the other side of it. His fat body is blocking the door. I rap on the window with my fist until he moves. Then walk to the curb to get on the failure mobile. The one my mother cherishes? The one she said I can't use? The one that isn't there? Not there. I pause to jot down a brief note in my detective log. Chapter 13 The Small Business Community is Under Siege It's hard to focus on industrial sabotage when you're sitting at a parent-teacher conference. But this much I know. Somebody somewhere needed total failure ink. Stopped. Our growing caseload was simply too much of a threat. So to stop us, they seized my mode of transportation. The obvious move is to set up a security perimeter around the neighborhood and began questioning witnesses. But I cannot, because I am bookended by two amateurs who have never ran a business. To my left is my mother, who made me get in the car as soon as I got back from Max Hodges' house. To my right is old man Crocus. All I can think as he yaps is that the man has been teaching too long. I say that because for the first time in his 150 year career, he faces the very real possibility that he will not advance all of his students to the next grade. I suppose here would be a good place to tell you about the student who threatens that stake. It's moments like this when I patiently wait for my mother to impress me with her spirited defense of her son. Maybe throw around some papers, kick over a chair, set fire to a desk. Instead, she nods. For a woman who is one day going to be begging for begging me for a job, she's doing a miserable job of impressing me. So for now, I have to depend on my business partner, who I ask to do some recognizances in my absence. That means scoping out the scene of the crime and gathering information in a discreet way that does not draw attention. It does not mean that which I found him doing when I returned home. Chapter 14 Orange juice shaken, not stirred. I am pacing Rolo Tuka's room like a man possessed. Because when you're a detective, you cannot be the victim of an unsolved crime. It is like a dentist with missing teeth or a gardener with dead flowers. And dead is what I will be if my mother finds out the failure mobile is gone. 
So I hatch a plan to keep my mother from knowing. On paper, it looks like this, but I can't focus because Rolo's head is rattling back and forth like a dashboard bobblehead. It is something that happens the night before every test. He is especially nervous tonight because he did not do well on his last test, the group test. And that was because someone in the group made the Scantron form look like this. I had to do it. If old man Crocus was going to pair me with you know who, I had no choice but to throw myself upon the gears of the machinery and make the whole wretched process come to a halt. Naturally, Rollo didn't see it that way. His vision is too narrow, but not me. I see the big picture, and I know that sometimes you just have to take one for the team. One day he'll thank me for that, but not tonight. Tonight, the poor kid's head is shaking like the tail of an espresso-sipping rattlesnake. Which reminds me, one day I will think far enough ahead to tie one of the cartons of orange juice I drank from every morning to Rolo's head. He says, shake well before pouring. That would look like this. And that is why I don't worry when I have a bad string of luck as a detective. I know I could always be an inventor. Chapter 15. Please don't squeeze the detective. I still must get to work, so I have a new ride. I call it the Totomobile. My business partner believes it is demeaning. I believe he's lucky to be employed. I wrote greatness on the side so that when people see us, they will know that we are great. But that greatness did not prepare me for what I would see at the Weber residence. For today, it is the scene of total devastation all murdered by the remnants of someone inhumane, someone determined, someone whose weapon of choice comes in packs of 6, 12, and 20. If you are squeamish, look away. Toilet paper, it is everywhere. As much of it hangs from the tops of the trees, which tells me that these criminals were adept tree climbers. That's a major clue, and I make a note of it in my log. I knock on the Weber's door. Jimmy Weber answers. He is in my grate. How's the family holding up, I ask. Fine, says Jimmy. It's not the first TP job we've ever seen. TP, I repeat to myself. I make another note in my log. I ask Jimmy for a complete list of his enemies. Enemies, he says. I don't have any. Everyone has them, I tell him. No, really, I'm friends with everyone. People in my class... People on my soccer team, people that work with me on the school paper, bingo. I want a complete list of all the stories you've written, I tell him. Stories, he asks. For the paper, I say. Oh, I don't really write stories. I just write what they're serving in the cafeteria this week. Why does that matter? I shake my head in disbelief. I try to remind myself that not everyone's a detective. Listen, kid, I say, someone doesn't want that information out there. Who, he asks. I point to the hanging toilet paper. Someone who doesn't play games. I go to hand him my card. 
Hey, Timmy, thanks, but I don't need your help anymore. What are you talking about, I say? You called the hotline. Yeah, over an hour ago, it took a while to show up. It's true, I was late. Total fell asleep in front of my bedroom door and I couldn't get out, which was very unprofessional on Total's part. Yeah, well, I'm here now and I'm on the case, I tell him. Sorry, he says, but I hired another detective. I hired, uh, don't say the name, don't say the name. Don't say the name, 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 don't say the name. Karina, Karina, he says the name. Chapter 16, the chapter I was hoping to put off, the one about the beast. Some evil looks like Ganesh Khan. Some evil looks like Attila the Hun. And some look like this. I really don't want to spend any more time writing about the center of evil in the universe than I have to. First, because I spend absolutely no time thinking about her. And second, because I really, really hate her. So let's be brief. The Beast owns a detective agency, the CCIA, which according to her stands for Karina Karina Intelligence Agency. I say it stands for Karina Karina is asinine, and it is the worst detective agency in the town, probably the state, perhaps the nation. Sadly, people are lured into hiring her by the look of her downtown office, which her rich real estate mogul father lets her use. It is, it used to be a bank. It has pillars and a marble floor and a large safe. It looks like this. As you can see, it's pathetic. And for those of us in the business, it screams amateur. The stupidest, most unprofessional thing about it is that it is on the ground floor. That means that when I move into the top floor of my downtown high rise, I will be able to throw things at her. Making the situation even more ridiculous, the sad little girl has a huge stockpile of high-tech surveillance equipment all furnished by her father. Cameras with zoom lenses, high power binoculars, hidden microphones, you name it. Now, maybe that seems impressive to you, but believe me, to some skilled, to someone skilled in the business, it says one thing, she needs it. Because real detectives do surveillance the old fashioned way with their own two eyes and from all sorts of undesirable locals, such as laundry hampers, which is a problem when your mother needs to do laundry a day earlier than you expected. Chapter 17, a change is gonna come. If you take one thing away from this chapter, let it be this. Timmy Failure does not lose a client to Karina Karina. What she's done is in taking the Weber file from me was unethical, illegal, and immoral. As a result, I have filed a complaint with the Better Detective Bureau. It is not the first such complaint I have filed against her. It is the 147th. Because I do not own a computer or a typewriter, I have to handwrite the complaints on notebook paper. Here is one I filed last month. Here is one I filed a week after. I do not even know where Turkmenistan is, but it sounds far away. Sometimes my complaints are more brief and to the point. And sometimes my complaints are of the follow-up variety. 
While these complaints are pending, I am also making two big changes to the agency. First, I bought a hat. Please do not ask why it says biscuits. I do not know. Perhaps the prior owner sold biscuits. The point is that it makes me look more professional. The second change is more substantive. I'm giving out free cheese. So far, business is booming, at least for the free cheese. Although everyone keeps asking me about the same stupid question. Where are the biscuits? Chapter 18. Counting on my accountant. I am sitting in my room. My mother made me. I have two spelling tests tomorrow and she said she wants me to study. But I can't because of the failure mobile. Yesterday, my mother said she was going to the garage to get it so she could take it for a spin around the block. I told her not to because there are spiders in the garage. She told me she wasn't afraid of spiders. I told her that I didn't mean to say spiders. I meant to say giant anaconda. She dropped the topic and hasn't brought it up again. But I can't keep coming up with Amazonian reptiles. Eventually she is going to catch on. And before she does, I've got to get the failure mobile, all of which means redoubling my prior efforts and putting significant resources into the search. Resources which Total Failure Inc. may or may not have. So I grab the agency's accounting records for the last six months. The records are one of the tasks I give to Total when he came on board. I trusted him because A, I did not have the time to do them myself, and B, he indicated to me that he had some accounting experience. I thus expected that the books would accurately reflect Total Failure Inc.'s gross revenue and expenditures for the fiscal year all neatly added and subtracted in rows and columns, like this. But that is not what they look like. They look like this. I search for my accountant. I find him sitting on the heating vent, eating the free cheese. I schedule a teleconference with my mother. Chapter 19. The answer, my friend, is blowing on my ear. I need an administrative assistant, I tell my mother. She is at the kitchen table. It is covered in bills. If you want me to study for school and run the agency, there's no other way. She doesn't say anything, so I ask again. Listen. If you just float me the funds at a re reasonable rate of interest, I can hire said administrative assistant. She turns her head towards me. Timmy, the stationery store cut back my air hours. So right now I'm a little short of said funds. I stare at the mess of papers on the kitchen table and pick up one of the credit card bills. In big, bold letters, it says, total amount past due, $1,485.23. This is it, I say, holding out the bill. This is what, she asks. This sums, I say, they're trifling. I hold up the phone bill, the gas bill, and the doctor bill. With the amount of money Total Failure Inc. will be taking in by the end of the fiscal year, I'll practically be able to pay this stuff out of petty cash. She rests her cheek against the top of her head. It will be a loan, of course, I tell her. Timmy Failure doesn't give handouts. She wraps both her arms around my chest and squeezes me into hers. But when the agency expands, 
will most likely have a position for you and will just deduct the funds owed from your paycheck. She blows really hard into my ear. It's something she does sometimes because it makes me laugh. Be professional, I tell her. She stops. Do it again, I say. Chapter 20. Being there, done that. I am climbing Rolo Tukas's dresser to show him how the monkeys put the toilet paper in the Webster's tree. He is barely paying attention. Sorry, our English test is in four days. I can't focus. So I tell him about Garbanzo Man. Who's Garbanzo Man? He's the agency's new mascot. I built him out of old clothes and a paper bag, all of which I stuffed with newspapers. I show him a snapshot I keep in my pocket. What's the point? asked Rolo. He's meant to convey a sense of fearsome greatness. I want to really intimidate the idiot that stole the failure mobile. Intimidate the person so much that they give it back. I'm going to put him on our front lawn next to a big sign that says Garbanzo Man Sees All. That doesn't make any sense. You don't make any sense. You're not focused, I tell him. Besides, you knowing nothing about marketing. Why'd you name him Garbanzo Man? Because Garbanzo means big. You're thinking of Giganto. Garbanzo is a bean. That's the thing about guys like Rolo Tukas. They think they know everything, but they don't. Anyhow, I have to study, Rolo says. I've got my tutor coming over to help me in half an hour. This is where I should tell you about the little fly in the ointment of my friendship with Rolo Tukas. Actually, it's not a little fly. It's a garbanzo fly. And it looks like this. That's right. Rolo Tukas's tutor is none other than the beast. I don't want to rehash the umpteenth arguments this has caused. So I'll just sum up our respective positions. Rolo's position Karina Karina is really smart and helps him get A's. Timmy's position. Rolo is a big, stupid traitor. Now, in fairness, I will say that when Rolo is around me, he tries not to say her name. He just says tutor. And he gives me plenty of warning before she comes over so I don't have to be in the same room with someone so unethical. All right, Rolo, I'm out of here, but do, do me a favor. Be on the lookout for clues. I think your tutor may have committed grand theft auto. What are you talking about? I think she stole the failure mobile. Rolo closes his book and stares at me. Her dad is rich, Timmy. I don't think she needs your failure mobile. This isn't about what she needs, Rolo. It's what I need, and I need the failure mobile. Don't you recognize industrial sabotage when you see it? Listen, Timmy, I really have to study. If you're so sure she took it, why don't you pay a surprise visit to that bank where she has her office? See if it's there. I have to admit it was the one decent tip Rolo's ever given me. So I drop a quarter in his pencil cup and pat him on the head. I show myself out and walk down the gritty street. Streets shrewn with clumped newspapers. A whole lot of crumpled newspapers, a trail of which leads to my front lawn and to the remnants of the man who was not as fearsome and garbanzo as I thought. Chapter 21. You can always go downtown. 
I head downtown to do some recognizances on CCIA headquarters because I am so well known and don't want to draw attention to myself. I go undercover, under my bed cover. So even I hate to miss an opportunity to promote. So I use the back of the blanket. Unfortunately, the disguise does not help and I am hounded by admirers, but I don't mind. For on these downtown streets, I sense it. The whole world has changed. Changed because in the shadow of the future home of Total Failure, Inc., I see my destiny. A destiny with which no man can tinker. I am the soon-to-be head of the world's largest detective agency, a multi-billion dollar employer of thousands who made it big and adhering to one simple credo, greatness. I am a detective without peer, a visionary without limits, a pioneer of tomorrow whose only challenge now is to remain humble. So for now, I walk humbly down the sidewalk to the pathetic bank that is CCIA's headquarters, all to follow up on Rolo's tip about the failure mobile, a tip that will prove to be wrong, because Rolo took us is always wrong. But that is okay, because the tip has brought me here, to the site of my skyscraper of greatness, which is right next door to the bank behind which is something I recognize. The world, the whole world has changed. Chapter 22. Happiness is not a dumb blanket. Here's how this chapter, chapter should have gone. Timmy Failure runs back to the back of the bank. He seizes the failure mobile. The evil one bursts out of the bank's front door Timmy seizes her by the collar of her evil coat. I have caught you, evil one. The evil one shrieks. Your shrieks will avail you not, Timmy declares, for you have been caught red-handed. The evil one cries. Your tears will not avail you not. Timmy declares, for you are history, as is your agency. It is all over. You are through. Head down, hands cuffed behind her evil back. The evil one calls out to Timmy as she is escorted to the police van. What do you want, evil one? Asks a gracious Timmy. To tell you one thing, she replies, drooling with envy from one corner of her sad little mouth. Say it. Timmy commands, you are greatness personified, she says, but that is not this chap how this chapter will go, because before all that could happen, this did. That's right, the United States government stopped me by snagging the corner of my bed cover on one of their mailboxes. Why? A bribe? By whom? Her nickname rhymes with the weevil bun. Let me just say this. It's a sad day when the government of the people, by the people, and for the people decides to affix those people to mailboxes. But a fix they did. And trapped I was. Until 20 minutes later when I realized I could take the blanket off my head. Only to see I was too late. For the failure mobile was gone. Surely whisked off by the same government officials who affixed me to the mailbox. But okay, now I knew the odds. Me against the weevil bun and all the governments of the world. Daunting for most, but I am not most. I am Timmy Failure. And no person or government or forces of nature can stop me. 
except maybe being cold at night because I forgot to retrieve my blanket and cannot depend on a friend to share the, his. Chapter 23, The Timinator's Judgment Day. Surrounded by dingoes, buried alive, doing math. These are just three of the horrific places I'd rather be than the place I currently am, which is standing next to the furious rage that is my mother in the garage. Where is it, Timmy? She shouts. Where is my segue? What are you doing out here? I answer. Cleaning out the garage, she says, and I want to know where that segue is. Why, are you cleaning out the garage? Timmy, tell me where the Segway is. My left eye twitches, then my right. It is something that happens when I'm nervous. I don't know. She says nothing. I say nothing. And it is then that I see the fury disappear from her eyes, replaced by something worse, something I cannot surmount. Mom's tears. I shout out the first desperate thing that pops into my large brain. Molly Moskins needed it for a play. This stuns my mother and me. Who's Molly Moskins? She asks, wiping the corner of her eye. An annoying girl who smells like a tangerine, I want to say. But I don't say that. I say this. A girl in my class. She's putting on a school play, and the main character drives a Segway. Don't ask me. It's her lousy play. My mother pauses, her frustration subsiding. Well, you should have asked because it wasn't yours to loan. I know. I tell her. Mistakes were made. Well, when can she return it? Next week, I blurt out, when the play is over. Stupid me. I should have said next month, bought me more time. Those mom tears have me clouded my judgment. Fine, but it better be returned that day. I saunter out of the garage, trying to avert suspicion. Give my mom a quick wave. Dumb move, I never wave. Get it together, man. Once out of her sight, I run for it. I know that I have to get to Molly Moskins before she does. Get our story straight. Granted, my performance wasn't pretty, but it worked. And at least it adhered to my brilliant, brilliantly conceived plan concerning the missing failure mobile. Chapter 24. The Fury Burrito. I do not like Senor Burrito. She is Molly Moskin's cat, and every time I turn my head, she dunks her paws into my tea. She likes you, says Molly Moskins. That's how she shows it. I am tolerating this because I need Molly Moskins. Need her to corroborate my lie. So I am on her porch, and we are having a tea party. We should have a tea party once a week. It would be wonder marvelously. Splendor for us, shouts Molly, displaying her tendency to use words that do not exist. This has been so excited from the moment I showed up at her door that she has not stopped yapping. I have not even had the chance to tell her. Tell her female cat is a senora and not a senor. Molly, we need to talk about something. Oh, I love to talk, she says. Molly, we need to talk about something. Oh, I love to talk, she says, pointing at my hat. Do you like biscuits? I turn to face her, staring directly into those bizarrely mismatched pupils. Molly Moskins, my agency needs you. Oh, she says, a modeling agency? You probably want me for my eyes. 
No, Molly, I explain. It's not a modeling agency. It's a detective agency. As I say this, I hear a spoosh. It is Senor Burrito. And she has taken advantage of my head turned to dunk two paws into my tea. Molly, my agency solves major international crimes. It is on the verge of being a multi-billion dollar corporation, the largest of its kind. I let that sink in. Her mismatched eyes widen. I love biscuits, she says, pointing at my hat again. I stand up to leave. You're wasting my resources, Molly, and I have cases to solve. I'll show myself out. But before I can walk down the porch steps, she rushes to block my way. Then sudden movement sends tangerine smell everywhere. Don't leave, shouts the tangerine girl. I have cases, lots of cases. She grabs my hand and runs inside towards her bedroom, where she slides open her closet door. My shoes are missing. Behind her is a large shoe organizer. It is filled with dozens of shoes. Well, not all of them are missing, but many of them. Someone international stole them. Finally, an international case. I return to the porch table to take copious notes. The first of which is, do not leave Senior Burrito unattended. Chapter 25. No jet for you. You cannot rent an F-16 fighter jet. At least that's what they'll tell you if you and your polar bear walk into an army recruiting center. Nor will they give you a Chinook helicopter. I explained that I am only going to level a bank, not even a classy one. I can give you this, the army recruiter says, pointing to the water cooler and handing me a Dixie cup. Total licks his lips. Sir, it appears you don't understand. I tell him. I've declared all-out war against the evil one. He looks up from his paperwork. I stare back at him. He's a four-foot-tall menace to society. He rubs his eyes. Listen, son, I've got work to do. If you're interested in joining the army, come see me when you're 18. What did I expect from the same government officials who affixed me to the mailbox? God knows what the evil one has told them about me. The lies, the defamatory statements. Surely she has attempted to frame me as a loon, which is why I wore the shirt I wore to the recruiting center that day. Sadly, my business partner took no such steps to ensure that he too made a good first impression. I tried to explain to him that this was the army, an army with rigorous weight requirements, and that he didn't fit in, fit them. But no, the big guy refused to lose weight. So when we walked into the recruiting office to rent a fighter jet, wham, we made a sloppy first impression. Impression. Just look, I told him we would. I think when my all-out war with the weevil bun is over, I'll do the poor mammal a favor, like send him to business school. Maybe there they'll teach him what a Dixie cup is. And maybe the next time we walk into an army recruiting center, we won't get kicked out again for doing this. Chapter 26. Late night. Epiphanies of the soul. I wake at 3 a.m. with a revelation. These things happen to good detectives. Our large brains never stop. 
and that revelation was this. When I was with Molly Moskins, and I told her I was going to leave her house because I was very busy detective, she stopped me and asked me to stay. Suddenly, claiming that many of her shoes had been stolen, I asked her to identify one of the stolen shoes. She pointed to a red shoe in her closet and said the other one was missing, but she was hiding it behind her back. That's when it hits me, what she was up to. So I make a note of it in my detective log. Chapter 27 grabbing the bull by the horns. Something is wrong with our educational system. I say that because it is boring. If educators really wanted us to learn, they would include little things during the school day that would make learning more interesting. For example, put Rolo Tukas and a bull in an enclosed space. That would teach me to never play with bulls. Instead, Rolo Tukas is my study partner, and he's dull as sand. The way this whole study partner thing works is that the teacher pairs you with someone else in the class. You teach the lesson to him. He teaches the lesson to you. Today's lesson is about identifying conjunctions. Here's how Rolo teaches me. Identify the conjunction in this sentence. We ran and we played. Here's how I teach Rolo. Who those, how those get in there? Knock it off, Rolo says. Crocus will see us. No, he won't, I tell him. He's reading Key West brochures at his desk. For what? Who knows? Listen, I need your help. With what? You need to infiltrate the CCIA. Infiltrate what, he asked. Old man Crocus raises the tips of his glasses above his vacation brochures. Do you two not have enough to do? We do, Mr. Crocus, Rollo says. What a butt kisser. I lower my voice. It's Karina Karina's intelligence agency. She's got my failure mobile. I saw it there myself. Shh, Rolo says quietly. I don't want anything to do with your stupid plans. Okay, I tell him, that's fine. Good, he says, but I think the next test is another group test, I tell him. Hope I can do as well as I did the last time. Rolo's head starts shaking like a maraca. Fine, he says. I'll do it. Now are we done? So I add one more thing. How do you feel about bulls? Chapter 28. Home at safe. You look fine, I tell Rolo. I do not look fine. I look stupid. He is dressed as a Shasta Daisy. How is this supposed to get me into Karina Karina's bank, he asks. We've gone over this. Say it again. You're Dixie the Daisy. You're part of the Human Flower Parade. So why am I stopping at the bank? Because Dixie the Daisy wants to open an account but she's just going to say it's no longer a bank and it's the CC whatever. Doesn't matter. By that time, you're done looking around, scoping the place out. Why don't I just go as myself? Too suspicious. She knows we're friends. I hand him four quarters. What's this for? He asks. Bus fare. You can't ride the total mobile you'd blow your cover. I can't do this. You'll be fine. But no, he would not be fine. He would be Rolo. What follows next is so 
aggravating to my professional sensibilities that I hesitate to include it in this book. It demonstrates how even a brilliant conceived plan such as this can be decimated by the bumbling of a moronic amateur. To distance myself from it, I have made Rollo write it in his own hand. My Account by Rollo Tukas. 2.55 p.m. Attempted to board bus. 2.56 p.m. Bus driver yells, Hey, weirdo! Get off my bus. 2.57 p.m. Begin long walk to bank. 2.59 p.m. Daisies, petals, poking people in eye. People mad. 3.01 p.m. Angry man with her eye starts plucking out my petals. 3.04 p.m. Me now. 4.30 p.m. Arrive at bank. Knock on door. Karina Karina says, Who are you? I say, Dickie the Daisy. She says, I look like a sad bunny. I tell her, I'm Dickie the Sad Bunny. She says, what the heck is going on here? 4.31 p.m. My head starts shaking. Karina Karina says, is that you, Rolo? I say, no, Karina Karina. 4.32 p.m. Cover blown. Karina Karina says, come inside, Rolo. Tell me what's going on. Total panic now. I say, big parade. Me, Dickie. Dickie want open bank. 4.34 p.m. Karina, Karina, concerned for my health. Head won't stop shaking. Karina, Karina offers me a glass of water. I say, Water, no. Me need leave. Can't speak. Karina, Karina receives phone call. Walks out of room. I try to do mission check out place. Find giant room where bank keeps safe. Walk inside. Hear sound of giant steel door being closed. 4.35 p.m. to 8.30 a.m. Locked in safe. I really don't want to go into all the stuff Rolo did during that long night. Hyperventilating when he phoned me on his little emergency cell phone. Calling me unfortunate names. Not saying thank you when I called his mom for him and lied, saying Rolo was spending the night at my house. Not listening attentively as I read him my copyrighted work, Surviving Enemy Capture on Beans and a Smile. Scaring the poor janitor who came in to clean the bank that morning, only to find a mutant bunny. The only regret I have from that night is the inadequate job Rollo did regarding recognizances because when I ask him for a blueprint of the bank, I expected more than this. Chapter 29, moving on up. So here's why my mom was cleaning out the garage. We're moving. She says that with all this stuff going on with her work, we have to move into an it, it. She says that with all this stuff going on with her work, 
we have to move into an, an apartment. All of this is neither here nor there because we will soon be making more money than is decent. But the short term effect is that Total Failure Inc. will finally be freed from the degradingly small closet in which it is currently confined. And that can be only boost workplace morale. I've scheduled a teleconference with my mother to discuss the new office space I'll have in the apartment. I've even submitted a design schematic for how the apartment should be laid out. In the future, upswing of good fortune, I've solved the Webster case. Perhaps you recall it. If not, look here. I focus all of my resources on it in order to show the weevil bun that I am not a detective to be trifled with. How, do, how did I solve it? Clue number one. Jimmy Weaver said it was not the first TP job his family had ever seen. TP stands for tiny person. And who's a tiny person? Besides, we already know Molly Moskin is an international shoe thief. That's called recidivism, i.e. a tendency to relapse into criminal behavior. But the biggest clue of all was the second one, one that I stumbled upon quite accidentally. You may recall that while at Molly Moskin's house, I drank a fair amount of tea, at least before Senior Burrito sat, sat in it. As a result, I needed to use the facilities. And that's where I saw it, hanging for all to see. That's right. Toilet paper, the weapon of choice for the Webster's attacker. In the bathroom of Molly Moskins, the girls on the one heck of cr crime spree. The girls on one heck of a crime spree. Chapter 30. The Chute Herd Round the World. Clang, kong, ding, a bing, ding, dong. It's not a new song. It is the sound that trash makes as it falls down the chute in our new apartment building. Chapter 30. The chute heard round the world. Clang, kong, ding, a bing, ding, dong. It's not a song. Clang, Kong, ding, a bing, ding, dong is not a new song. It is the sound that trash makes when it falls down the chute in our new apartment building. I am familiar with it because it is directly adjacent to my Total Failures World Headquarters in the hallway. That's right. Ignoring my repeated requests for a teleconference, my mother rented a tiny one-bedroom apartment. Now I sleep on a fold-out couch in the den, and my corporate headquarters is by the trash chute in the apartment building's hallway. Normally, I'd call a board meeting to discuss this untentable agreement. Normally, I'd call a board meeting to discuss this untenable arrangement, but I can't because I do not have the support of half the board. That half is happier than ever. Hi friends, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Hit that bell for notifications for when I post the next video. Until next time, bye.